Hello, my name is Dr. Carlo Oyer, and in this patient education video, we're going to take a deep dive, pun intended, into deep vein thrombosis, or clots that happen in the vessels of your body, in the deep connective tissue and muscles, and what are its implications, why does it happen, what is the treatment, what is the follow-up, what should you be worried about. All of that will be here in this video. Venous thrombosis is a condition in which blood clot or a thrombus forms in a vein. This clot can limit the blood flow through that vein causing swelling and pain on the area distal to the clot. Most commonly, venous thrombosis occurs in the deep veins in the legs, thighs, and pelvis. This is called a deep vein thrombosis or DVT. DVT is the most common type of venous thrombosis, however, a clot can form anywhere in the venous system. If a part or all of the blood clots in the vein breaks off the site where it is formed, it can travel through the venous system and this is called an embolus. If the embolus lodges into the lung, it is called a pulmonary embolism or a PE, a very serious condition that can lead up to 50,000 deaths a year in the United States. So, deep vein thrombosis and risk factors. If a person is found to have a DVT and there is no known medical condition or recent surgery that could explain why the DVT happened, it is possible that an inherited or congenital condition is to blame. This is especially true in people who have a family history, DVT or PE. In these cases, testing for inherited thrombophilia, a genetic problem that can lead to more clots, may be recommended. Medical conditions or medications. Some medical conditions and medications even can increase the risk of developing a blood clot. For example, cancer, immobilization, whether it be through hospitalization, recovery from an injury, being bed rest or even paralysis, any of those, immobilization for too long can cause DVT. A previous DVT or PE, increase in age, obesity, pregnancy, and certain medications, for example, birth control pills, hormone replacement therapy, tamoxifen, thalidomide, and erythropoietin, which is a drug to stimulate blood production. The risk of a blood clot is further increased in people who use one of these medications and also have other risk factors. Then there's smoking, heart failure, kidney problems such as nephrotic syndrome in which you spill proteins into your urine. Surgery and related conditions are also risk factors. Surgical procedures, especially those involving the hip, pelvis, knees, increase the person's risk of developing a blood clot. During the recovery period, prolonging activity can also increase the risk of developing a blood clot. People diagnosed with a venous thromboembolism are occasionally found to have an inherited thrombophilia. Examples of inherited thrombophilia include factor V laden, the prothrombin gene mutation, and deficiencies of antithrombin, protein C, and protein S. Acquired thrombophilia. Some types of thrombophilia are not inherited, but can still increase a person's risk of developing a blood clot. Examples of this include certain disorders of the blood, such as polycythemia vera, that's when you make too many red cells, or essential thrombocytemia, in which you make too many platelets, those tiny little sticky cells. Also, antiphospholipid antibodies. These are antibodies in the blood that can affect the clotting process. Elevated clotting factors. Having an increased level of one or more factors involved in blood clotting, such as factor A, increases the risk of a blood clot. So, let's talk about the symptoms of DVT. The classic symptoms of DVT include swelling, pain, warmth and redness in the involved extremity, usually the leg. Then there's superficial phlebitis, or SP for short. It can cause pain and tenderness and firmness and or redness in a vein due to inflammation or infection and or a blood clot, which is a thrombus. It is most commonly seen in the inner part of the lower legs. SP differs from deep vein thrombosis because the veins affected are near the surface of the skin. Superficial phlebitis is not 
a DVT, but in up to 15 to 20 percent of cases, if you have superficial phlebitis, you might also have a DVT. So how do we make the diagnosis? If your history, symptoms, and physical exam suggest a DVT, you will have to get tests to confirm the diagnosis. Tests may include a blood test called a D-dimer and compression ultrasonography of the legs or the extremity or other imaging tests. Let's first talk about the D-dimer. D-dimer is a substance in the blood that is often increased in people that have clots. If the D-dimer test is negative and you have a low risk of DVT or PE based on your history and physical exam, then DVT or PE is unlikely and no further tests will be necessary. Now let's talk about compression ultrasonography. Compression ultrasonography uses sound waves to generate pictures of the structures in the extremity, the legs or the arm or whatever. For this type of exam, you lay on your back and in the stomach and your ultrasound one is applied to the extremity. In most circumstances, compression ultrasonography is the test of choice for patients with suspected DVTs, highly sensitive, and you can see the actual clot. Other imaging tests. Although no longer used widely for the diagnosis, in some cases, for example, if it's not possible to perform an ultrasound for whatever reason, another imaging test may be done. These include MRI, which uses a strong magnet to produce detailed pictures inside your body. And then there's commuted tomography or CT scan. Finding the cause of a blood clot. After confirming that the TVT or PE is present, the healthcare provider like myself will want to know what caused it. In many cases, there are obvious risk factors such as recent surgery or immobility. But in other cases, the clinician may test for the presence of an inherited form of thrombophilia or for another condition associated with the increased risk of venous thrombosis, such as cancer. People with some acquired or inherited abnormalities may require additional treatment or prevention measures to reduce the risk of another thrombosis. Some experts recommend that the family members of a person with inherited thrombophilia be screened for the inherited condition. If, let's get to the treatment of DVT. In treating DVT, the main goal is to prevent a PE, a pulmonary embolism. Other goals of treatment include preventing clot from becoming larger or progressing, preventing new blood clots from forming, and preventing long-term complications of the clot. The treatment of DVT and pulmonary embolism are very similar. In both cases, the primary approach is anticoagulation. Other available treatments which may be used in specific situations include thrombolytic therapy or placing a filter in a major vessel like the inferior vena cava. So let's talk about anticoagulation first. Anticoagulants are medications commonly called blood thinners. They don't actually dissolve the clot, but rather they help prevent new blood clots from forming. There are several different medications that might be given as anticoagulations. For example, these pills, uh, the common names are Seralto, Eloquist, and Pradaxa. Then there's low molecular weight heparin, which is given as an injection underneath the skin. And there's also Lovenox and Fragmin, they're very similar. Then there's unfractionated heparin, which is given into a vein through the IV route or as an injection underneath the skin, a sub-Q dose. This may be the preferred choice in certain circumstances, such as if the person has severe kidney failure. Initial anticoagulation usually consists of 5 to 10 days of treatment with low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin. After that, long-term anticoagulation is continued for 3 to 12 months, a year. The choice of the anticoagulant depends on multiple factors, including your preference, doctor's recommendation based on your situation, medical history, and cost consideration. Some of these medications are super expensive. So if money is an issue, make sure you visit the manufacturer's website, which often provide up to a month of free therapy. Duration of treatment. Anticoagulation is recommended for a minimum of three months for a patient with a DVT. If you had a reversible risk factor, 
contributing to the DVT, such as trauma, surgery, or being confined to a bed for a prolonged period of time, you will likely be treated with anticoagulation only three months or until the risk factors are resolved and no longer. Expert groups suggest that people who develop a DVT but do not have a known risk factor may need treatment with an anticoagulation for an indefinite period of time. However, if this is your situation, you should discuss the pros and cons with your doctor after three months of treatment. If the decision is made to continue anticoagulation, your doctor will continue to reassess on a regular basis. Some people prefer to continue anticoagulant, which may carry an increased risk of bleeding, while others prefer to stop the anticoagulant at some point, which carries the risk of repeat thrombosis. What about walking during DVT treatment? It used to be that if you were diagnosed with a DVT, we would put you in a hospital under bed rest. We were afraid that moving around would actually dislodge the clot and turn into an embolism. However, once an anticoagulant has been started and symptoms such as pain and swelling are under control, you are strongly encouraged to get up and walk around periodically. Studies show that there is no increased risk of complications like pulmonary embolism in people who get up and walk and start walking. In fact, might help you heal faster. Let's talk about thrombolytic therapy. In some severe life-threatening cases of DVT, a healthcare provider will recommend intravenous medicine to actually dissolve or clot-busting medication. This is called thrombolytic therapy. This therapy is reserved for people who have serious complications related to DVT or PE and who have a low risk of serious bleeding, as a side effect of therapy will be bleeding. The response to thrombolytic therapy is best when there is a short time between the diagnosis of the thrombus and the actual start of the therapy. Then we talked about the inferior vena cava filter, IVC. This is an umbrella-type device that actually blocks the clots that are traveling through the bloodstream and catch them. It is usually placed in the inferior vena cava, the large vein that leads to the liver and then the heart, to catch the clots before it gets there. An IVC filter may be recommended in people with venous thromboembolism who cannot use anticoagulants because of a very high risk of bleeding. However, in the long term, IVC filters can actually increase the risk of you developing even more clots. So, how do we prevent DVT? During hospitalization, some people who are in the hospital either for surgery or for medical admission, especially those with bone or joint surgery, even cancer surgery, may be given anticoagulants during the admission to decrease the risk of blood clots. Anticoagulants may also be given to women at high risk for venous thrombosis during and right after pregnancy. In people who are hospitalized and have a moderate to low risk of blood clots, other preventive measures may be used. For example, some people are fitted with inflatable compression devices after surgery. These devices are worn around the legs during and immediately after surgery, and periodically fill with air, compressing and moving the blood flow. These devices apply a gentle pressure to improve circulation and helps prevent clots. Another alternative to use compression stockings may also be recommended. In all cases, walking as soon as possible after surgery can decrease the risk of a blood clot. It can also decrease the risk of chronic swelling in the legs from your DVT also known as post-thrombotic syndrome. Let's talk about extended travel. Prolonged travel, for example, taking a long airplane flight or a car ride, and by prolonged I mean about four hours or more, definitely nine hours or more is high risk. That appears to increase the risk of developing blood clots. Special precautions for people with deep vein thrombosis. Risks of developing another clot. People being treated for venous thrombosis are increased risk of developing another blood clot. Although this risk is significantly smaller when an anticoagulant is used, you must watch for new leg pain, swelling, and or redness. If any of these symptoms occur, you must call your doctor, seek attention, medical attention, as soon as possible. 
Other symptoms may indicate that a clot in the leg has broken off and traveled to your lung, causing pulmonary embolism. These are very important and include the following. A new chest pain with difficulty breathing, a rapid, accelerated heart rate or the feeling like you're gonna pass out. A pulmonary embolism can be a life-threatening complication and requires immediate attention. If you have any of the above symptoms, call for help right away. Bleeding risk. Anticoagulants such as heparin and warfarin can have serious side effects and should be taken exactly as directed. If you forget or miss a dose, call your healthcare provider or clinic for advice on how to resume it. Do not try to take just an extra dose or change the dose yourself unless your doctor tells you to. If you take warfarin, there are many other things that you need to be aware as well as its effect of anticoagulation can be affected greatly by your diet and interactions with a whole bunch of medications. You are more likely to bleed easily while taking anticoagulants, so bleeding may develop in many areas such as the nose, gums, excessive menstrual bleeding in females, and bleeding in the urine or even the poop, bleeding or excessive bruising in the skin, or vomiting a material that is either bright red or looks like coffee grounds indicating digested blood. Bleeding inside the body can cause you to feel faint or have pain in your back or your abdomen. You must call your healthcare provider right away if you have any of those symptoms. It's also important to call immediately if you have an injury that could cause internal bleeding such as a fall or car accident, even those that seem minor. You should try to wear an alert tag. While you are taking anticoagulants, wear a medical bracelet, necklace, or similar alert tag that includes the name of your anticoagulant at all times. If you end up needing treatment or you're unable to explain your condition, the tag will alert responders that you are on an anticoagulant and at risk of excessive bleeding. Hey, that is all I have to say about deep vein thrombosis. I hope you learned a lot. I certainly did putting all this together for you. Just remember that no matter what I've said here, you must always consider the advice of your own medical provider for your own medical condition, as this is intended to be an educational video only. For other videos, just like this video, go to patienteducation.video. My name is Dr. Carlo Ojed, and it was a pleasure for me to teach you about deep vein thrombosis. We'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this video, please consider subscribing and hitting that bell notification so you don't miss any new episodes.